What's going on everybody? It's your boy Shogi from Shook Earth Media and today we're taking a look at ESOM number one. This is an independent comic series in all new superhero universe called The Ripperverse from YouTuber Eric July aka Young Ripper 59 He's a creator I've followed for a long time. He's a political commentator. He also comments on art and comics especially. So it is great to see somebody not only taking a stand and giving their opinion on different pieces of art, but also trying to create their own thing, trying to be the solution to the problem they are pointing out. And I always respect this attitude and I love independent artists in general. So I'm very supportive of independent artists trying to break away from the mainstream. And this campaign was a massive success. It was millions of dollars, lots of books sold. And I got the book in hand right here. We're going to review it today. Always in my reviews, I flip through the book and take a look at the story. We talk about what works for me, what doesn't work for me. I will say in general, I enjoyed it. But I just want to impress before we get into the content of the story that the print quality of this comic here is above and beyond the standard I think I've ever seen. This might be the best quality of paper on the interior. Literally, it's the same quality of colors that we get on the interiors as the exteriors. This is not typical at all. I think that the interiors have a lot of detail and the quality of the paper is a huge factor in what really makes this work. I mean, here an example is we got red lighting in this nightclub scene, right? And there's scenes uh, in the nightclub as well where they have even more red hues in a lesser quality paper it would be hard to distinguish the uh the foreground from the background with this but with the print quality and how good the colors look on here that that that's what you're paying for is how great the colors are how great the uh how it feels so good like it just feels nice and soft and the back cover has a lot of detail so the art above all, like if you look at the pictures and you like the art, you're going to love the book. So that that's just what I want to say. We're going to get into the story, things that work and things that don't work for me. But the, the art and the color, the way things pop and the level of detail in the art, I mean, it must have been a challenge for the artist to work with such high quality printing material because usually you don't get this level of detail. But I've rambled on about that enough. Uh, I just, before we get into the story, I just want to say sometimes with these, you know, anti-woke um, kind of independent projects, I do worry that it's just going to be the polar opposite of what they're talking about. They're talking about uh, usually far left progressive types inserting their uh, political beliefs into the storytelling. And uh, I, for me personally, I don't like seeing it from either side. It doesn't matter what side it is. It could be 100% my opinions on the page. I, I don't want to see that in a work of art, though. I want to be entertained. I want to be asked to think about things more than just, oh, I agree with that. I want to I want to have questions. I want to have thoughtful stories. I don't want my own beliefs just parroted back at me. And I'm thankful to say that um, this, this is a genuine, earnest attempt to tell a good story and create new original characters. It is not his platform for his political beliefs because he already has that platform he doesn't need to put his politics in here because he can just come out and say his politics so i'm thankful to say that that is kept to a bare minimum the only political reference in the entire book is right here you get eric has a self-portrait in here and he's got a hat on that says taxation is theft if you know eric you know that that's that's what he believes but that that's as close as this book ever gets to anything political in here and it's really just about the storytelling and that i think is the ethos that his company wants to put out we're here about good stories we are not here to tell our fans how they should vote we're not here to uh, use our stories as a soapbox for all of our political beliefs etc so i think he holds to that ethos in this book so um as far as the anti-woke stuff that's as far as i'm going to get into that now we're just going to break down the story and all of that, and I'll see you guys at the end of the video. So before we break the book down scene by scene and page by page, just overall, I want to say that I think this book does a good job at establishing our protagonist, Esom, aka Avery, 
Avery has a mysterious past and there's a backstory that we don't get to see in his first issue, but we get hints of it. But he's an interesting character because of his motivation. We're in his head here. We get to see his thoughts. An interesting thing is that he's kind of motivated by this sense of disrespect. He was disrespected by somebody. And even though he had his main goal was to save somebody, he's now more concerned about his personal pride. So I think that's interesting because it can go either way. It can be a hero story or a villain story. Or maybe he's just in, the, in this neutral middle ground. So I like the character. He's interesting. And that's the most important thing that Esau number one had to do. Is introduce his main character. And I think they succeeded in doing that. And meanwhile, while it's trying to do that, it is also trying to build up the universe. So we get a lot of characters that are only introduced very briefly. And we only really get hints at everything. And this the, that's the thing with this story. It's like we only get hints at Avery's backstory. We only get hints of what's going on with uh, the girl Jasmine that he's trying to save. We only get hints at what the connection between him and his sister is like. It's all about setting up the long game. So to a degree that's at the expense of really honing in on Esom's story that we're trying to set up all these other things like a villain who plays into the beginning very briefly and then doesn't take part in the rest of the story. Right now it feels a little bit like unconnected events, but future installments could tie everything together in such a way that all of this criticism right now is going to end up being irrelevant. So that's the thing with it. It would be like trying to judge a first season of a TV show based on the first two episodes or something. So we're only seeing a part of the whole. But the dialogue is good, the writing is generally good, and now we'll break down maybe some scenes that don't work for me. But in general, it's an enjoyable book, good action scenes, good dialogue, and I'm genuinely interested in continuing to see where the story goes. So it is a success as far as an issue number one. But don't go in expecting a full complete story. So I did mention how good the paper quality is and that's what's baked into the price. But I think it is worth mentioning that there's some valid criticism when it comes to the price. Because I don't think I've ever paid this much for like a, it's 100 pages or so of comic roughly. And it's $35. I think that's the most expensive comic book I've probably ever heard of. That isn't like a collectible item obviously. <laughs> But um, yeah, the price is definitely worth pointing out. So it's a bit it's a bit high. I would honestly be willing to sacrifice some of the paper quality to just get the story across and, ha uh, and just be cheaper for the fans. And now I have to warn you that there will be spoilers in the rest of this video. So if you don't want to hear spoilers for ESOM number one, now is your warning. I thank you for watching this long. And for everybody else, let's just break into the book. All right, guys, so here we got the book, Esom, right in front of us here. And as you can see, this is cover C. This was a variant cover. Uh, I was a little late to the game, so I didn't get A or B. I don't know if the back is the same for all of them, but I almost like the back better than the front. This is Esom here, and his powers, as we can see of right now, is super strength. I don't know if he has any other abilities. Uh, he seems to be able to move quickly. Uh, there's a point where it seems like that might be another power of his. Uh, but basically, we don't get to see him in this full form. So we see him in, on this cover here. And he's in his costume and everything like that. And uh, we don't actually get to see this form of Isom. In fact, we don't even know that Isom is the name he goes by uh, as a superhero until the last scene of the book. So um, basically, we are dealing with Avery who is his actual name, and uh, this is not his daughter, it is actually his niece. So, at first I just kind of assumed, oh, he's a family man based on this portrait. You know, keep in mind, I only read the page of the campaign, so I didn't really know a lot going into this. So with this message, he's saying he wants to be customer first and all that, he wants to respect the fans. And I, I do think this, this ethos influences the character here in some interesting ways, indirectly, but I do think it, it, it is... Uh, we'll, we'll get back to that in a bit. So we start off the comic here with uh, the police force. We're looking at the city and uh, there's a news report about crime in the city dropping and a politician takes credit for it. And then police officers say that uh, they complain about the politician taking credit for it. 
And then they reference the fact that uh, the, the vigilantes, Max vigilantes, are helping them reduce the crime rate. So really, I, I like how the cops are also doing the same thing the politicians is, are doing. Because I'm assuming based on this that the drop in crime is thanks to the people with superpowers that we have that are called accepts in this universe. We'll get back to that. My only criticism here is that this storyline with the cops and everything, at least as of issue one, does not factor into the rest of the story. It just kind of sets the scene and establishes where, that we're in a world with superpowers and that these vigilantes are helping the cops out. And it pretty much just exists to give us a foreshadowing that a villain has returned. You know, she is back or something. Uh, somebody's really desperate. You know, and, and I get that setting the scene. I just feel like we could have started off with something stronger. Uh, there's a lot of voiceover from Avery in this. And uh, I think the voiceover, usually I tend to say uh, avoid voiceover when it's not necessary. I think that it is necessary in this book to get inside Avery's head because there's certain decisions that he makes that you would be questioning as a reader if you couldn't read his thoughts. So I like that we are, uh, you know, establishing that he is our voice in this book and that like we are reading his thoughts directly. But I guess uh, Eric wanted to preserve a little bit of mystery at the beginning so we don't hear his thoughts right away. But I almost would have rather had him set the scene than uh, have this scene with uh, random cops that don't really tie into the story after that. But minor criticism at the end of the day. And uh, here is the inciting incident in the story. We have Avery's sister, whose name is Altona. She uh, is calling him about a girl that is a family friend. Um, her name is Jasmine. And she is missing. But uh, Altona suspects that Jasmine is involved with a uh, kind of gangster guy that Avery used to know. So I like that we're hinging this story on things that happened in Avery's past that I'm assuming we're going to get illuminated a little bit more. We get some hints of it. We don't really get to see the origin story itself. Um, so I, I like that we're preserving a little bit about this character off the bat and we're going to unravel that as we go. Just know that this issue one is in no me by no means is this a complete story. Um, so it, it ends on a cliffhanger and there's a lot of questions that I have about Avery and his past, why he gave up the vigilante life, all these other things. Um, none of that gets answered in this book. We don't even really know, you know, he, he's moved out the, to the country, away from the city. He doesn't want to be a vigilante anymore, but we don't really know a lot about what he's doing other than the fact that he owns a farm that this guy here runs. Um, so, you know, there's definitely things I would have liked to know, but uh, these all could pay off in future issues. So, you know, it's not an actual issue. But I like this inciting incident, giving him uh, a connection to the situation, a reason to go back. He's reluctant to go back to the city, but, uh, you know, and he, he doesn't just drop at his sister's beck and call. He questions it. But he is convinced, and it's because of that personal connection that he has to the guy, that he is forced to go. So I like that. And then we get introduced to a supervillain here, uh, whose name is Yaira. Really like the design. She's flying. Uh, she's got some kind of laser powers. And then we get introduced to this other... Uh, they seem not like a police force, but they're organized. Alpha Core here, they kind of go against the supervillains. And they don't seem like official police, but they seem to have some kind of organized effort that works with the police. So, um, you know, I like setting the scene here with that. Um, again, these are just kind of introducing these characters and concepts. And for the most part, it doesn't really play into the story. I would have liked to know a bit more about who she is. We just get to see her. We don't really know much of what, like, why is she fighting these cops? Like, what is the purpose of this? There's a lot I would like to know. But this book, it really is just about planting the seeds for this universe. It's not really going too in-depth into any particular character. I mean, the closest we get is is Avery, Esam, and I, I, I like him the best. So. so here we got Avery pulling up to the club, his friend... Um, Darren owns 
I guess they used to uh, roll together at a certain point. And it's intriguing backstory because I'm a little interested, you know, was uh, was Darren a different guy back then? Was he doing this criminal activity back then too? Was Avery in on the, the criminal activity? Did they come to blows about that before? Maybe that's why he left. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about the history between them. Um, and, and maybe that that's actually a strength of the book. You know, I, I like uh, the fact that I'm interested to know the backstory. So it's kind of got a noir setup to it in the sense that like we're looking for this missing girl, except he's not a detective. He's not a professional vigilante. It's similar to a lot of stories, but he's very much just like a regular guy. Um, he doesn't go in with a plan. In fact, they specifically make points that he doesn't have a plan. We get to see who Avery is in this scene, I think. Um, we get a lot of backstory in uh, exposition bubbles here. And, you know, my, uh, my only real issue with this is it's very exposition heavy. It's written as if, the dialogue is written as if it's talking to the audience and not to... Of Avery here for for example I mean he's saying in our first year of high school you and I completed competed for roster spots on the freshman team he would never say that to Avery because he would know he would say it in a more vague way you know he's talking he, he's speaking to Avery as if he doesn't know about his past in a way I mean this is a minor thing this happens in a lot of comics and movies and stuff but what I really like about this scene is the fact that we get set up that um, Avery has a very strong pride and his he feels disrespected in this scene because he's saying uh, you you had Darren saying that you had everything set up for you you have both uh, parents in your household you were uh, destined for success but you wasted your opportunity and that's a uh, very hurtful to Avery and he takes it personally and the rest of the story, in, in Avery's own words, he just wants to punch this guy in the face. He doesn't actually care about Jasmine anymore. Although he, d he does demonstrate that he does care, but uh, that's not the primary thing for him anymore. It's disrespect. And this is what I was talking about earlier when I was saying that the ethos of this comic company is kind of embodied in this character in the sense that he wants respect, or rather he doesn't want to be disrespected without consequences and i think that's kind of a symbolic of people who feel disrespected by the current comic industry because it's very much uh one-sided and if you think differently than them politically you're the bad guy you get depicted as a villain in in your in the works and you know there's of course the twitter verse that is just all the time pointing fingers and canceling people etc so i i think the point his point is you can't disrespect me without consequences so i that that's the ethos and that's the character we got and i, and I think it makes an interesting dynamic because he's honestly like a revenge revenge quest is usually a, a villain's journey so <laughs> we have a character who isn't really a hero but he's not a villain either he is doing the right thing he's he, he basically has the right targets um, so he could go down the villain route at some point, or he could become a hero later, or maybe he just stays in this neutral territory where he's uh, more about um, his personal pride than anything. Regardless of which way it ends up going, it's an interesting character. It's not what, exactly what I expected. I expected somebody a bit more heroic, and I'm actually glad that he isn't, you know, uh, fully heroic, you know. So I find that interesting. But I also like how we see here that Avery is kind of a no-nonsense guy he cuts straight to the deal you know he's here to see darren and somebody who's a little bit more tactful who's a little bit more uh considerate of uh, the situation he's in and more of a detective somebody with a plan he wouldn't just go straight to business he would beat around the bush a little bit he'd be a bit more tactful but i like that he's just like hey where's jasmine straight up like he doesn't dance around it like uh, might actually be the smart thing to do um, so we, then we get our first fight scene here and we get a demonstration of his abilities and I absolutely love this fight scene. I like uh, how we demonstrate that the deck is very much stacked against him. And also we kind of establish the fact that um, when Darren and Avery knew each other, I guess Darren doesn't know 
that Avery has powers. So we're establishing uh, that there was a change over time. He wasn't born with these powers. And uh, we don't get any information on why he has the powers or anything like that. I am curious, but I kind of like that we skip past that and just get straight to the story. He's very strong. You can see, like, there's some blood here. But I like uh, Isom Avery here is fighting all these guys, and they're 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 no big deal. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, of course, the in the back of my head, I'm like, these guys are gangsters. They would have guns, you know. And I would have liked to see, can he take a bullet? I'm curious... Uh, how far his abilities go and that might have been uh, this might have been a good opportunity to showcase that but instead what we get is uh, we get to find out that Darren has superpowered people working for him and this guy is even bigger than him and I like that we have uh, Avery despite the fact that he looks so strong just a page or two ago he gets roundly defeated and then he gets thrown and then we get a chance encounter where Avery hits into the supervillain that we were introduced to earlier. Now, I do wish that this chance encounter here was the impetus for the rest of the storyline, but it does, now that I've read the full thing, where I thought this was this big moment when actually the story really kicks in, this is just kind of an aside. You know, I like the situation, and it's important that it puts him in the hospital, but we don't see this character, the supervillain character, after this. Um, and it, But maybe we're supposed to get... She is fast here. You can see that she runs up and attacks him in this... And later in the book, Avery does this same move to somebody else. So maybe, maybe he has the ability to gain other people's abilities just by watching them kind of... Uh, there's other superheroes that have done that. The first one that comes to mind for me is Peter Petrelli in Heroes, but I know comics people are probably going to like cringe at that, <laughs> me saying that. But that's the first person I think of. I, I think maybe he can absorb people's abilities. So maybe that's like the main purpose behind the scene, but it didn't feel as integrated with the rest of the plot as I might have liked, you know? I, I was thinking, oh, all of this is going to tie in together. The supervillain, you know, she's somehow related to the situation or, you know, her, her involvement in the situation escalates things. But, you know, it, does, it doesn't feel that integral to the plot. And also, if you have a chance encounter like this in a story, you just got to watch that you don't have too many of them. Because you can have, a, uh, I love stories with chance encounters as the foundation or the inciting incident. But if you rely on that too much, it just feels tropey and it kind of loses a bit of realism, you know, ver verisimilitude or whatever the word is. Just because, you know, we know chance encounters, they do happen all the time, but it's not every issue of a comic series, you know. <laughs> so that's just an aside. But um, I really like, uh, I like Avery's thought bubbles. You know, I like to hear his perspective on things. So here he gets thrown by the supervillain and he crashes on this taxi and then he ends up going to the hospital now here's a scene i kind of do have to criticize um i i love the dialogue here don't get me wrong we're talking about um the difference between living in the country and living in the city and why people move on move um actually that's a later scene but still it still applies we're, we're back on the farm this is avery's farm this guy's running the place and he's making the decisions. This subplot, I don't know what I'm supposed to get out of it other than Avery has a farm. Um, I do like some of the dialogue later, like I said, where we're talking about country life and why people choose it. Really good dialogue, but if it doesn't pay off in later issues, I'm not sure what the point is. You could have gotten the point across with just a line of dialogue or something. I'm guessing this character is going to be important later. But as for the plot of this particular issue, he's really not important. You could have cut all these scenes back at the farm out and not lost anything story-wise, in my opinion. So here we're back at the hospital. And here is where we are kind of confirmed that the superheroes are called Accepts. You know, it's spelled um, E-X-C-E-P-T, Accept. And uh, I like that we have a unique word for superheroes. You got to do that with branding nowadays. You want to make uh, your, your universe unique. So we need a special word for superheroes. I think the word accept reads well on paper. 
I think saying it out loud, you might confuse it with words that sound similar, like accept, like I accept this gift or whatever, you know? I, I think we might've found something that sounds a little bit better. So uh, basically he's recovered fine from the hospital and he ran away and then he has this GPS thing that uh, tracks him at all times and it apparently sends out a signal that sends his coordinates to people he cares about. We got his sister picking him up and I like their relationship. The uh, dialogue is good. I like we got a little bit of humor here. You know, she's saying, if you don't update me, I'll tell mom. <laughs> and here we are back at the farm. This is the scene I was talking about that I really like where they're talking about um, life in the city and how people in the city are kind of spoiled in the sense that they don't think about where their food comes from. Here we got Avery playing detective. And I like that we see how he thinks because he's not a detective naturally. And he's, he's just trying to get information. So I feel like we could have had maybe a montage where he does several things to investigate instead of just talking to one guy. But that's a small nitpick, like it works as is. And now here you get a great example of what I was talking about earlier with the print quality because of this red lighting. And these muted reds would not really look great on the quality of paper you usually get from like Marvel. And we meet somebody here who's got green eyes. I'm guessing he's in an accept as well. I don't know if this conversation actually is gonna set up anything, if this is a character we're gonna see later. I like these one-off conversations. They just feel a little bit disconnected from everything. But I like that he's talking about, you know, these are rich people and people pretending to be rich at this club. And that is every club I've ever been in. <laughs> and it's mostly the latter. So I, I like that line of dialogue. And here, I really love how we're in Avery's head and we're talking about how he doesn't have a plan and he's here because of vengeance. And this is so important. This is why I say you need to have this inner monologue here on, on page because if we didn't have this, it, it would look like he was doing the dumbest thing. Like, why doesn't he have a plan? Why doesn't he? I would have all these questions if we didn't see the text right there. He's just like, yeah, I'm not really a vigilante. I'm not a detective. And my pride is hurt. I shouldn't be taking this personally, but I am. So I really like that. And then we get another twist where we just find Jasmine right away. But that's cool because there's still a mystery there. Um, I do f This scene feels a little bit like a lot of noir movies that I've seen. So I've, I've, I feel like I've seen this scene, you know, dozens of times. But I like that we just get right up front. We see her so we know that she exists. You know, we're not going to get some stupid twist where, oh, Jasmine isn't even here. <laughs> you know, she's here. Um, it gives him more reason to uh, get into this fight he's about to get into. Um, so, of course, you know, he, he's really not doing the smart thing. But like I said, we had that set up and it's relatable. You know, I think it's relatable that he, he don't you go into places without a plan sometimes and you, people do stupid stuff, make bad decisions. But, you know, his heart is partially in the right place, partially not in the right place. Makes him an interesting character. I think it's a unique take on it. So we get another fight scene here. I really love this full page spread. Again, an example of the amazing lighting that we get. So it's a bit repetitive um, in terms of we just had a fight earlier in a similar situation, but I think it's different enough and we get the different dialogue and it's and it's escalating things. And I really like, uh, you know, he the guy who defeated him last time because he's learned something new from the lady, as I mentioned, this is him doing it. I think that's how he's able to defeat this guy. So I kind of also like how different characters have different ways of talking. So it's sign of uh, good writing. So Avery then runs away and then uh, he we get to visit uh, his sister and her daughter. And you know, I, I like the family dynamic. I like, uh, and I like how smart the little girl is that she figures out that uh, Avery is a superhero without needing to be told that. So Again, it's great dialogue here, and honestly, like, this character, Avery, and the family dynamic we set up is the most interesting part, and they're likable characters. I find them interesting, and then we get another little hint of what's going on with Jasmine. Uh, she's, like, pacing around on a security camera, and they have theories about what it is, and I am curious to find out. Of course, we don't get an answer. Then we get the villain, the nightclub owner, Darren guy. Uh, we get him having a speech about how Avery's got to go down. The only thing that's, uh, I like this scene, it's just him crushing a glass with his bare hands. Unless he's a superhero as well, which I didn't really pick up on that. 
that would hurt and it seems a little unnecessary <laughs> so that's a little silly but and then we get the final scene where it's, it's this guy is like uh edna mode from the incredibles and he just makes people costumes so avery used to have a costume in the past and now he's here to pick it up because he might need it again but I, I like this conversation and they're talking about how uh you know it's not good it, it's too old and you need an upgraded version so we have an editor's note here and the costume guy is saying that he remembers avery as esom and then uh, he says you have a memory on you and uh, memory has an asterisk next to it and it says a story for another day so presumably we are going to get the actual origin story i'm guessing what that that's what that means basically after that last nightclub scene every other scene here is just a a teaser for next week and that or next issue rather and that's about as far as we get so we get the costume guy and that's cool and then we get uh you know this this page here that we're not done yet you see what the costume looks like he's still not a vigilante because he's uh resistant to that idea but we of course know that's where it's going to end up <laughs> he's going to get dragged into this whether he likes it or not and here we got some cool uh, characters, previews of characters that are coming up. A rock band of accepts, their eyes glow, and they can fly and all this other stuff. And they speak in old time language. And they have lyrics that are uh, representing their reality. Maybe these guys are immortal or something like that. Nor, nor Frika. So, yeah, I'm excited to see more of these guys. Maybe they get their own comic, or maybe they're in the upcoming ESOM. It's hard to, hard to tell. And we get a preview for the next issue that there is a hit out on Avery and his family, which, again, like, him being reckless is part of this character because, you know, obviously he, put his, he puts his family at risk by, by making the decisions that he makes. So I think he's going to pay for his recklessness, which I hope to see. Uh, and then we get, you know, a little assurance that the supervillain we got is going to come back. So basically, I... And then we get uh, Eric's band saying that they will be back as well. A little ad for them. So it's a good book. Basically a bunch of little seeds. and It's more of a teaser of the universe to come than it is a story that is self-contained on its own. So I'm more interested in it as uh, how will the rest of the universe turn out. But I would say that it's good, it's solid, it's not like amazing top tier. So that's my review of ESOM number one, guys. I am looking forward to see what more comes from the Ripperverse. I'm glad that we have an independent project like this that's really successful, and I hope we see more like it in the future because there is no reason we need to be beholden to these corporations that all have the same opinion on absolutely everything. We can do our own thing and tell our own stories and there is in fact a market for it and that is a comforting thing and i always look with inspiration towards success stories like this so you guys know my opinion on the book and with that thank you guys for watching if you want to see more reviews like this definitely hit the sub button and the like button and i'd love to hear your opinions in the comment section down below we do cover comics here, but usually we cover TV and movies, and I hope to see you in future videos. And with that, it's been your boy Shuggy. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching, everybody. Peace out.